وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد In our last lesson we stopped at the 10th stress uh, in which a student of knowledge goes through when seeking knowledge. We're now going to go into the 11th. Alhamul Hadi Ashar. The 11th stressor which a student of knowledge goes through. And that is Hamud Dirasatin Nabamiya. The stress of going to academic schools, universities, colleges. Student of knowledge, he wants to study the religion, he wants to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he has college to go to, he has universities to go to. And so he really struggles with how should he, how should he do this both. And inshallah ta'ala, the way to cure this stress and to overcome it inshallah ta'ala is to take these two points on board. The student of knowledge has mutanafisani thnani. He has two openings Allah has done for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two openings, two golden opportunities. The first one is if you're seeking knowledge and you go uni and you go college, take on board al ijazat al dirasiyah, the holidays in which you have. You have summer holidays, Christmas holidays, Easter holidays, you have midterm. These holidays you benefit from them. You note it down, you make a diary for it, and you write what books you're going to study in those holidays. So you tell the ulama and the mashayikh or whoever you want to study with, you inform them that you're going to what? You're going to read this book on them in this holiday. So you benefit from al-ijazat al-dirasiyah, the holidays in which you get. The second one is al-hayat al-amaliyah ba'da al-takharruj. After you graduate and you start to get to, you get a job, you can then choose to take some of your studies for after that. The sciences don't have to be all studied at the same time. You can't delay some things. Al-Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, the great scholar, it was said about him, فَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَأْخُذْ عِلْمَ الْقِرَاءَاتِ He did not take the science of ilm al-qira'at إِلَّا فِي آخِرُ عُمْرِهِ He did it in the later stages of his life when he passed the age of 80. وَقَدْ تَجَاوَزَ الثَّمَانِينَ مِنْ عُمْرِهِ he passed 80, 80, then he done it. But pay attention to this. He was making sure that he didn't just sit around and when he reached 80, then he started to seek. He was busy with other things. He was busy with studying other sciences. So not every single science can you learn in one time of your life. So there are some things that you're going to have to push to the end of your life. So that's one way to overcome this stress. And if students of knowledge, wallahi brothers, they did that. You made a diary for yourself. Every single holiday that came in the year, you made sure you wrote what books you're going to study, what particular books. And every single year you went through a mustawa, a level. And you went through this level. And then you went through this level. And this level, wallahi, you'll see yourself. Years to come, you've benefited from your time. The 12th stress, al-hammu thani ashar. The twelfth stress is Hammuz Dihamil Mutatallabat. The stress of 
is the hamil mutatallabat, the demands that you that you have, and the things that are needed from you overcrowd, it becomes too much, it's crowding. The demands are two types: mutatallabat shariya and mutatallabat qadariya. What does it mean, mutatallabat shariya? Mutatallabat shariya are things that are requested and needed from you and you have to come with through the Sharia. The Sharia is what's requesting you for these things. So it gets it, it kind of gets in your way when you're seeking knowledge, such as kabirri wal being dutiful towards your parents. Your parents want you to come over. They want you to visit. They want you to do things for them. They are asking you for this and that. Birri al is mutatallabat shar'iyya, silatul arham, going and visiting ties of kinship and family members, islah zawja, rectifying Hamza Joji, Hamza Joji, Hamza Joji, it's distracting me a lot, Allah. Wa islah zawja, perfecting the situation of your family, your marriage, and things like that, they are mutatallabat shar'iyya, things that the sharia wants from you. It is what? It is what the Sharia requests from you and the Sharia needs from you. So these kind of things, they get in the way of seeking knowledge. The second type of mutatallabat, second things that, that are demanded from you, and that are, these are mutatallabat, matalib qadariya, which is your own health, your own physical health, making sure that you are getting the right amount of sleeping, and getting the right amount of fitness and etc. These are mutatallabat qadariya. Because your sleep and your eating pattern plays a role in your seeking knowledge. So you don't, you don't know how to re reconcile between all of that. So how can a person overcome this? And how can he come to cure this problem? The way that he can do that is, is two points, brothers. Number one is, organize your time. Because there are mutatallabat shar'iyya and mutatallabat qadariyya that you need to come with. You need to organize your time. Tanzimu waqtik. Organize your time, number one. And number two is, the responsibilities that are on you, the demands that are coming to you, what you need to do is, you need to write them in order how important they are. So you place a maratib, a level for the, 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 the demands. What's the most important? Then what comes second? Then what comes third? And what comes fourth? What comes fifth? You organize it like that. With those two, you would be able to overcome this stress. Then what you would do is that the time that you get, you would first of all go through the most important thing, and then the second most important, and then the third most important, and the fourth, and the fifth. With that, inshallah ta'ala, a person can. But if you don't have your time organized, you don't have no organization for your time, and of course, the huquq, the responsibilities that are upon you, you don't know how their levels are, then what you're going to do sometimes is you're going to do things that are less important when you should be doing what's more important. And if you don't have restriction on your time and your time is not organized for you, then you would what? You would be spending extra time some places where that time could actually be given to who? To somebody who your mother, for example, your father, and you're spending this time with your friends. Al-Hamm al-Thalith Ashara. The thirteenth stress that a student of knowledge goes through is Hamm al-Dha'fi al-Badli fi al-Da'wati ila Allah Ta'ala. The student has this stress which is giving da'wah and calling to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The student feels that because he's seeking knowledge, he's actually not calling the people to the deen of Allah. And it stresses him out. 
calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ahsanu al-aqwali and it is from the akmal al-a'mali it's from the greatest speech and it's from the greatest of actions as Allah said it says in the Quran وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is greater in speech than the one who calls to Allah and comes with righteous action and says that I am from the believers. But the key to da'wah is what brothers? The key to da'wah is وَمِفْتَحُهَا الْعِلْمِ Its key is knowledge وَالْبَصِيرَةِ And to have insight. As Allah said in the Quran قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي Say to the Muhammad that this is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Which I call to Allah. عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ Upon insight. أنا, I do that. وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي And anyone who follows me does that. وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ Exalted is Allah. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And I am not from the pagans and the polytheists. So this ayah tells us that أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call to Allah upon what? عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ Upon insight. And then da'wah needs what? It requires insight, it requires the key, which is knowledge. To go and give da'wah, you need knowledge. ibn al-Qayyim, he says that the person who busies himself with knowledge, he's actually busy in giving da'wah. The reason why he's busy in giving da'wah is because لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ وَسِيلَةٌ مُوصِيلَةٌ إِلَى الدَّعْوَةٌ That knowledge is a means that will reach you to call into Allah. And the one who busies himself with the means is also, uh, the one who is busying himself with the means is busying himself with the foundation. And as the Qaeda goes, وَمَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ If calling to Allah becomes obligatory, is what you have to do, then any means which you have to take, any means to fulfill this ultimate goal of calling to Allah also becomes obligatory. So it takes its ruling. Rahimahullah. So how does a person overcome this stress of feeling that I'm seeking knowledge, but I also am not giving da'wah. The way that the person does this is that, is that by understanding and comprehending that the responsibility of your da'wah when you're at your early stages of seeking knowledge is not what it is when you become a scholar or a mufti or a qadi. Not every single person's da'wah is the same. People are different. وَلِذَلِكَ فَلَيْسَ الْوَاجِبُ عَلَىٰ أَحَادِ الْمُتَعَلِّمِينَ مِنَ الْمُبْتَدِئِينَ وَالْمُتَوَسِّطِينَ مِنَ الدَّعْوَةِ الْخَلْقِ كَالْوَاجِبُ عَلَىٰ الْعُلَمَاءِ وَالْقُضَاءِ وَالْمُفْتِينَ the way that it's obligatory on the mufti and the qadi and the, it's not the same way that it's upon a student of knowledge. A beginner. The beginner, there's an amount that might be needed from him. The student who's advanced, there's an amount that's needed from him. And the scholar, there's an amount that's needed from him. وَلِذَلِكَ The people whose da'wah is the ultimate and it's the completest and they fully have to go out to give da'wah is none other than what? The prophets and the messengers. Prophets and the messengers. When you are young, there are some particular clothing that you wear that was good for you when you were young. So when you grow older, can you wear those same clothes? Not because of the size. Because of the style, you can't wear this type of clothes for you. It's not appropriate for you. So when you were a beginner in, in seeking knowledge, there was this particular thing for you. And now that you have become an, an advanced individual, there's an amount that's needed from you. And that basically means that the person stays in line with what is upon him and doesn't go overboard. Al-Hammul Rabi Ashar. The 14th stress that a student of knowledge will attain is Hammul Nafaqati Wal Qut. The stress of provision and income. Students very sh are stressful when, seek when seeking knowledge, money finishes, you stress. You don't have nowhere. Sometimes you want to come to a lesson and you're unable to come because you don't have the money. Or you want to buy a book to study but you don't have the money to buy the book and etc. So the person becomes stressed. And Shaytan, the enemy of Banu Adam, he uses this method to scare you and terrorize you 
on poverty and to make you feel that you need money. He scares you with it. And he tries to build in your heart the love of this dunya. So how is a person able to overcome this? Number one, bring tranquility to your heart by realizing that the risk that Allah has written for you will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written a risk to come to you and you will get that risk. As Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا That there is no riding beast or there is no individual on the face of this earth except it is upon Allah their provision. So the provision of your provision, your income, your food is all upon Allah. You have to realize that one. You have to know that. And entrust Allah wa ta'ala with it. That's what Allah says in the Quran. In Allah huwa razzaqu dhul quwwati al-mateen. The verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al razzaq the provider. Dhul quwwati al-mateen. And what's very powerful is that Allah said this after he told you to worship him alone. He said to you, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ After Allah told you to worship Him alone and not to associate partners with Him, and that He created you and brought you to this world to worship Him alone, in that same context Allah tells you, I will provide for you. In other words, if you busy yourself with worshiping Allah alone, and you surrender your affairs to Him, then إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّة Al-Mateen. The second thing that the person needs to come with is that to have this unwavering conviction, al-yaqeen, this certainty, bi-i'anatillahi, Allah is going to aid his awliya. Allah is going to aid his awliya. And every single Muslim is a wali of Allah. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, every single Muslim is a wali min awliya illah. The levels in which people are the awliya of Allah differs, of course. Because Allah said in the ayah, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ And every believer has iman and taqwa to an extent. So every believer is a wali min awliya illah. But the iman and the taqwa are not the same. Some people's iman is great and high and complete. And some people's is low. And the, the variation of that Iman and Taqwa is the variation of the people's wilaya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala aids his awliya. Allah aids them subhanahu wa ta'ala. ta'ala. If a leader today, if a leader will not forsake man qama bi khidmatihim, the leader who, if you do him justice and you do for him what he wanted from you, he would stand up for your rights and he would give you what you want. Should we think of the most just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ahkamul hakimin, the best one? That he's going to forsake the one who stood up for dinihi to give victory to his religion. The one who stood up to protect the religion by ed educating himself and learning. Do you think Allah is going to forsake that one? That's not the case. وَلِذَلِكَ pay attention to this hadith that Ibn Majah narrated in his sunan. In hadith of Zayd ibn Thabit رضي الله تعالى عنه in which Zayd ibn Thabit said that the Prophet said مَنْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا that the Prophet said مَنْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا anyone who makes this dunya his ultimate goal هَمَّة he makes this dunya his ultimate goal he lives for this dunya he aspires things about this dunya it's all the dunya for him فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرَهُ Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala will disperse his affairs. What will Allah do? Allah will disperse his affairs. His own matter, Allah will scatter it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلَ فَقَرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ And Allah will place poverty right in front of his face. This man's got so much money in his account. He's a millionaire, but poverty will not leave him. Allah will make him feel poor. وَجَعَلَ فَقَرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ The poverty, Allah will place it right in front of his face. All he can see, when something is right in front of your face, that's what you can see, right? All he sees is poverty. He doesn't see the, the, the money that's in, in, his, in his account. He can't see it. وَلَمْ يَأْتِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَا كُتِبَ لَهُ And what he will receive from this dunya, it will be only what Allah writ for him. He, he's, he wanted this much, but what will come to him is what Allah writ for him. 
ومن كانت الآخرة نيته and anyone whose had his aspiration his want is the akhira جمع الله عليه أمره الله bring all of his affairs together okay Allah will organize everything for you وجعل غناه في قلبه Allah will place in your heart heart richness you know that day you got no money but you know what you just feel rich you don't feel stressed Allah will make you rich سبحانه وتعالى وأتته الدنيا then the dunya will come to you وهي راغبة the dunya will come after you and you're running away from it and it's coming after you the dunya will come to you so why is this is because you turn to Allah you turn to the akhirah so Allah brought the dunya to you the third thing that the person needs to do is that ihsan dhanni billah think good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala faqad ahsana ilayka fi rizqika Allah did he not perfect your provision mudhu kunta radi'an when you were being breastfed and you were being nursed who is it that was taking care of your provision when you couldn't even walk and you knew nothing who is it that brought rizq to you until the age that you reached now who is the one who is bringing you rizq from all, all places and who is providing for you subhanahu wa ta'ala now that you've started to realize things what makes you think that, what makes you think that your affairs is fully all in your hands the poet he said ma laka qad ahzanaka al faqr why is it that poverty has brought sorrow and sadness to you wa qad jama'ta al hamma fi al sadri and you've compiled and you com- you brought in your heart and you gathered in your heart stress inna alladhi ahsana fi ma mada the one who was good to you in the past yuhsinu fi al baqi min al umri he's the one that's going to be good for you in the in the time that awaits you the future to come he's the one who's going to take care of you subhanahu subhanahu wa ta'ala number 4 السعي في طلب الرزق number 4 is that we not denying that you need to stand up and look for your provision number 4 is the way to overcome this stress is you have to work to get a job you need to الاخذ باسبابه you need to take the means you need to work because Allah says in the Quran فاذا قضيت الصلاه فانتشروا في الارض وابتغوا من فضل الله Allah didn't say stay in the masjid when the salah finished and the jum'ah is done, Allah, what did he say to you? فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Go out and look for the, from the virtues of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the believer works. It's not, min, it's not from our religion that people just stay in the masjid. It is not from our religion. Rather, what Allah commands you here is to go out and make an income. And then the person gets, and the final thing, the fifth thing, that the person needs to come with is after they work and they put the effort in the fifth thing that they need to come with is that the risk that they are trying to attain and the risk in which they are trying to get you need to tell yourself you're only going to get, get I mean, you only should try to get risk ما يحفظ قوتها that which you can only keep your strength with ويسد حاجتها the provision that you're trying to attain, let it just be based on your needs and what you want. And that which you can uh, keep your strength and your backbone as a student of knowledge. Bidalik Sheikh Nasir Rahimahullah Sheikh Albani, he used to open his shop because he used to fix watches. And so what he would do is he would make money for that day and what he needed. So he doesn't ask anyone. And as soon as he's made his daily income, he would close the shop. Lidarika, many Salaf, Aima to Salaf, they used to do that. They used to make sure that they had their daily income best. Once they made their daily income, they would not in any way, form or shape uh, carry on making money. They would close their shop and they would go out to seek knowledge. So if a student of knowledge does that, it's better for him. He makes what he needs for the month, the means to get to his place, A to Z, and then he focuses and he's seeking knowledge, then that would inshallah ta'ala remove that stress. Alhamul khamis asha, the fifteenth stress. nafsi bin nikahi. The stress of being chast. The fifteenth stress is being a person who is chast by getting married. This would be marriage 
reconciling, as some would say, between marrying and seeking knowledge. As we all know, that the fitratul insaniyah, the way Allah created us as men, is that we are inclined to women. And Allah Ta'ala, He created the women uh, towards the men. Both parties, Allah Ta'ala created in each party inclination towards the other, the opposite gender. And so this desire is in each and every one of us. The person has a desire. So this desire of getting married, get, getting married and seeking knowledge, how would one reconcile between the two? First of all, the one who says to you that getting married and seeking knowledge, that it would disconnect you from wasalat al-talab, that it would disconnect you from seeking knowledge, then what you need to remember this is uqdubatun shaytaniyyah. It's a lie. It's a satanic lie. And that's not the case. It will not stop you from seeking knowledge. But there are other factors that can cause it not to happen. The marriage itself will not stop you from seeking knowledge. But there are things that come with it that can cause you not to seek and attain knowledge. So the person who has the desire to get married, then they should go forward and get married. Who have the ability, then they should go forward in getting married. But they should follow these steps if they want to overcome the problem of not seeking knowledge later. The first of that is, if you don't have the desire to get married, it's not in you. That's not, it doesn't come to your mind. You're focused. Then don't sit in gatherings where marriage is being spoken about and waste your time of talking about something you truly know that you have no desire for because other people are doing it. It seems that you can focus on seeking knowledge, then you should go and focus on seeking, seeking knowledge because you don't have that distraction in your head. But the one who's distracted, that every time he's thinking about marriage, then that individual is what I would say to him here, the following. Is Find a spouse, a wife, and the sister should find a husband who loves knowledge. A person who is passionate about seeking knowledge. Now, they are, sorry, Sorry, they are in love with knowledge. They don't have to be students of knowledge. But they love knowledge. Muhibbatin lil ilmi, muadhimatin li ahlihi. She venerates and glorifies the people of knowledge. She knows their testators and how they are. Wala yalzamu an takuna talibat ilmin. She doesn't have to be a student of knowledge herself. There are some women who know the scholars what they are and their value. She knows the importance of knowledge and how it is, but she's never embarked on it and she's never sought knowledge. Marry a woman like that. And if she's a student of knowledge, then that is what? It's a cherry of the cake. But if she's not, as long as she respects knowledge and she knows its status and what it means, then this is a woman you should go forward for. She's not an obstacle, she's, a, she's an asset. She's not a liability. The second thing, Ikhwani, is Ihsanu Siyasa. It's to perfect your running of the situation of your house. If you're running your house correctly, and the way that your house is running is correct and it's right, and how is that? Making sure that Allah, as a man, He placed the responsibility in your hands. You're the man of the, of the house. If you're making sure that you're running your house, and you're making sure that everything is going accordingly, and you don't place the responsibility then everything will go in accordance to the plan that you set. But when you take a step back, there will be things that will be put into the schedule that would slow down your seeking knowledge. Number four, making sure that your spouse, whether it be a wife for a husband and a husband and his wife, if, you have, if a wife, a sister, sees her husband is not seeking knowledge like that, she, the way she is. She tries to bring him on board. She tries to make him seek knowledge with her. And the same with the brother. If he's married, bring your wife with you. Musharakatu fi talab. 
that she participates in seeking knowledge with you. You bring her to the seminars that you go to, the intensive courses. You're there together, you're seeking knowledge together. Number five, informing your wife and the, hus the wife informing her husband الأجري, the reward that comes with seeking knowledge and the participation that this, your spouse is doing with you in seeking knowledge, the virtue that it has. And also informing them of the reward that Allah will give them for aiding you in w taking this path by helping you and supporting you. The next point is to agree with your spouse. The wife either agrees with her husband or the husband agrees with his wife. You take an agreement with your spouse that there's going to be a time that's going to be yours. I'm going to designate a time for you. A time where I'm going to give you your rights. A time, inshallah ta'ala, that if you want to have a discussion and a meeting, it's going to be on that particular day. If there's a problem, we don't talk about it through the whole week. On Saturday, on Sunday, on Monday, that day is the day we sit down and we speak about if there's a problem in the week that we need to discuss. So that your spouse will not then take it out in the, next, the other days of the week. And then you inform them that that day would be the day where I would do anything you need from me, whether it be general or specific. The next one, Ikhwa, is <coughs> rewarding them for the patience that they are showing. The husband, he rewards his wife for the patience that she's showing in him seeking knowledge and aiding them the free time that you get. And also bringing to them what their nafs is inclined to. As in gifts, to show and express you are really the gratitude, the shukr that you have, that they are allowing you to attain knowledge and gain knowledge. The wife does that for her husband and the husband does that. The husband does that for his wife. You buy them a gift. You express uh, gratitude for their patience in you seeking knowledge. All of these brothers and sisters are factors that will help you still carry on seeking knowledge. And then <coughs> your spouse will then not be an obstacle for you. All of these that I mentioned, all of these usul that I mentioned, ya ikhwa, it applies to the person who is married to one wife or, that, or the one who is married to more than one wife. وَلَكِنْ يَجِبُ يَا إِخْوَةِ But brothers, it's obligatory. When I say the word, obligatory. For a student of knowledge, أَلَّا يُبَادِرَ نَفْسَهُ That he doesn't hasten. بِضَمِّ زَوْجَةٍ أُخْرَى That he marries a second wife. That if a brother is married to one wife, أَلَّا يُبَادِرَ نَفْسَهُ بِضَمِّ زَوْجَةٍ That he goes and he marries a second wife. Whilst he wants to seek knowledge. The reason is فَكَثْرَةُ الْوَاجِبَاتِ Increasing on the obligation on yourself. تُثْقِل it, we, it, it slows you, it, heavy, it makes you heavy. If you're carrying a big, heavy load on yourself and then somebody comes and adds another load on, are you going to reach your destination fast? Are you going to reach your destination fast? And then marrying a second spouse is, is like that. It makes you heavy and weak and it slows you down. Even if you're still moving and you're strong and you're picking the load, you're going to get to that destination and the end, you're going to get to it slower. Whereas the one who doesn't have any of that, he's running faster than you are. He's going there faster. So a person, a student who's dedicated, who's married, my sincere advice is Allah yubadira nafsahu that he does not hate, hasten to making himself marry a, a, another wife, that he sticks with his first wife if he's married to her. Alham Asham. The 16th stress is Hamu Islahi Dhurriya. When you're seeking knowledge and you have an offspring, you have children, or you have family members, brothers or sisters, perfecting their situation or you seeking knowledge. My own family are like this, but I want to seek knowledge. My own children, walidhalika, the ulama, they said, they said, and al fasad, the corruption that steeps into the da'i's children is greater than other people. 
<laughs> the reason is because they are busy with the people and islahi awladihim than their own children. They are preoccupied with the general mass and the people. And so whilst they are carried away with that, their own children, they lose the plot. And shaitan, he puts his effort and multiplies it towards them. So what's the way to overcome that? Because the person sees their children growing and their children are getting older and older. And you're seeking knowledge, you're in the middle of ilm. You still haven't reached your, your level that you're looking for. But you see your children, they're not, they're not going to stay there for the, they're growing. So how do you, how do you overcome this stress? The first one, brothers, is by choosing a righteous wife. This is where the benefit comes in. That the righteous wife, because you're out there seeking knowledge, she's holding it down for you at home. She's educating these children for you. She's teaching them. She's correcting their manners. She's correcting their way that they carry themselves. The Prophet told us, dunya This dunya is a, it's a slight joy. This dunya is not eternal. And wallahi, the best joy in this dunya, the Prophet said, is a righteous wife. Any man who loses everything in this world but just has a righteous wife, he will be, mashallah. The day your ikhwah, your house is not good and your house is not in line and you're struggling in your own household, ya akhi, your life is st stressful and you will feel pain and agony. So your own children and your offspring and your offspring being good you can save that by making sure that the women you bring to your children who's raising them their mother is a woman who can hold hold the children and educate them and teach them it's very very important number two dawam dua ilahum consistently making dua for your children whilst you're seeking knowledge whilst you're traveling you're always remembering your children you're making dua for them bisalahi wal hidayah that Allah perfects their situation, that Allah guides them subhanahu wa ta'ala. The parents' supplication to their children is the fastest it reaches them. And it's one of the th times in which the dua is accepted. When a child when a parent makes dua for his own child. So when you're seeking knowledge and you're in that time of righteousness and good. You're looking at your children and you're asking Allah Taala to keep them steadfast and that Allah Taala makes them pious. Number three is istihabuhum, <coughs> companionship. That your children, you befriend them. To where? Ila riyadh dhikr To the gardens and the circles of knowledge. You bring your children with you. You tell them to come out. They come to you, hilaq dhikr the circles of knowledge you tell your children come out. The reason why you do that is because the barakah is it not coming down when the people are in the circles of knowledge. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, نَزَلَتْهُمُ السَّكِينَ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَ وَمَنْ بَطَعَ بِي عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ That Allah's mercy and the barakah is covering the people in the circles of knowledge. So if you're bringing your child to this place where Barak and Rahmah is coming, so your child's still going to receive that also as well. وَلِذَلِكَ The reward to get so much to bring your children to these places, all of them. If today, Billahi alaykum, if you were told that there's a place in which you're going to get money, a lot of the people, and you, if you come, anybody who comes will be given money. You see parents bring all of their children so each child can get the money for them. And when they go home, they take all of the money off the children. Sahih? Five kids, they know it's good for them today. Sahih? What about if your children come into that place, all of you guys are getting barakah and rahmah. This is something that the person will do. But well, there's a story I'm going to tell you, brothers. This story is none other than the great Imam. His name was called Abu Al-Waqt. Abu Al-Waqt Abdul Awwal ibn, Abdul Awwal ibn Shu'ayb ibn Isa Al-Sijzi rahimahullah. This man, many people don't know him. Abdul Awwal. Abu Al-Waqt his name was. 
His name is Abd al-Awwal ibn Shu'ayb ibn Isa al-Sijzi rahimahullah. Abd al-Awwal, there's a story about him. The story is mentioned by a, another imam by the name of Yusuf, Yusuf ibn Ahmad al-Shirazi rahimahullah. He said, I came to Abd al-Awwal. I came to Abu al-Waqt. I came to him and I told him that I traveled from a very far land and that I came to take hadith from him. And he specifically said, I came to take from you Bukhari. So Abd al-Awwal, he said to him, if you truly knew who I was, then you would not have wasted your time to travel to me. And he started to cry. Because the man traveled very long distance, cut a very long... Then Abd al-Awwal said to him, I will tell your story. He said, I will tell you a... I'll tell your story. He said, when I was young, my father and I used to go out and seek knowledge. And he said, I was seven years of age. I was seven. He said, my dad gave me two rocks. He told me to put one rock in my right and the other rock in my left. And he tied his leg on with my leg. And he said, come, let's go seek knowledge. He said, I'm seven year old, my father. His steps are bigger than mine. He's given me extra load. When he sees that I get tired, he tells me to take one of the rocks and get rid of it. And then after I walk for a while, he says to me, drop the other rock in the other hand that you have. And I drop it. And then he tells me to keep walking. And then when I keep walking, I get tired. I can't keep up with him. He would take me and he would put me on his shoulder. And we would go and seek knowledge. And people would go by and they would say to him, Isa, come on this riding beast. And if you don't want to, then let your son Abdul Awwal at least sit on a riding beast and be there. And he would say, Wallahi, I will not take a riding beast to gain the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I will go for it on my barefoot. So he's the age of seven brothers. ولذلك عبد الأول رحمه الله رحمة واسعة. He became an imam. يرحل إليه. People would travel to him from all over the world. And how did he attain this and how did he get this? The reason he got this is because his father befriended him. His father took him in and he took him to every circles of knowledge that he went and the books of hadith he took from him. And he became what? He became known as Abu Al-Waqt. A man who knew the value of time and what it meant. وَقِسَّتْهُ طَوِيلَ He has a long story. The fourth thing, brothers, is, is that you place love in the heart of your children about knowledge and the reality of knowledge. And how do you do that? You do little competition in the house for the kids. And you try to make a prize and a gift for the person who wins. This is a way that you do it. You, you say whoever, you test them and anyone who wins gets a gift. This is something that would what? That would place in the children's heart. I wallahi, I never forget. Personally, I never forget. My Quran teacher, when we were young, we finished the first five juz. I was six years old, six or seven years old. We finished the first five juz. And we care. So I remember that, that last day I read the, uh, that page with Qur'an Qa'adin إِذْ أَنْذَرَ قَوْمَهُ بِالْأَحْقَافِ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ النُّذُرُ مِنْ بَيْنِ I read that part. Finished it. So he said, tomorrow there's a competition now. Five juz, I'm going to test. Anyone who wins is going to get, you know those old cassettes, those, those Walkman. You remember those Walkman? Huh? We just put it open it. He bought us that, wallah. What he did was Jazahullah, Wallahi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him. He made, you know, the whole Quran cassettes. You know, remember those the cassette used to be book, you open, and all those cassettes were in there. So he made uh, uh, Muhammad Sadiq al Mashawi, Rahimahullah. He, he, he organized it for us. So anyone who won got the, kiss, got the Walkman headphones and everything, and he had a, uh, the Quran, all of it was given to you. Okay, and you have you had your batteries. So he gave you those three, and it was so big for us. So we were trying hard, and everyone was reading it and test. So 
I don't know who won from my brothers and sisters. What I know was I was one of those who got the gift. I don't know how, did he just give it to all of us at the end? I don't know what, where, why, but I got it. And subhanAllah, it helped me a lot, it really did. As a child, it meant a lot to us. So these jawa'is and musabaqat and competitions, it goes far. A child will never forget it. Tashji'an lahu. It will make him love the Qur'an and love, love the uh, hadiths and whatever you're teaching him. Number five is that if you're seeking knowledge and it's stressful for you, then find a good teacher maybe. Ikhtiyar mu'adda billahum. Somebody who's going to manner them and discipline them. Who's going to correct their etiquettes. Walidhalika the salaf, if you look at them, the leaders would bring their children to the scholars. Sah? And they would say to the children's lead, scholars, I brought my son to you so you can manner him, discipline him. So they would make sure that the child is disciplined. Also that the parent observes the children's situation inside the house and outside the house. They observe it. If he comes with something that's outside the order, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Correcting him. Also, the parent, what does he do? Shira'u kutubu aqlam. Buying your children pen and paper. And even by Allah, I, subhanAllah, just now when I went to the Ma'rad, Egypt Ma'rad, I took my kids with me. So I went to the book fair. So they took the books, they were picking their little mutun. So they, so they, they don't know what the book is, but they just look at the cover, so they like it. They base their love on the cover. So you buy these little mutun. And guess what I did for them? In the house, there's a little section we said, this is your library. Okay? This is your little maktaba. This is your little library. So every morning they will wake up, they look at the library, and they walk out. Ah. You don't understand, but it, it means valuing knowledge, and ilm, and books, and, out, and the time that you're reading as a student of knowledge, and you're learning, you just give them a pen and a paper, and you say, take a book from your library, just like I have to kind of book from my own library, and everyone study. These are things that will help the young kid, uh, will benefit him a lot. Also that the parent observes that children, who, and who, has they who have they taken as a friend, and who are they hanging around uh, with. Alhamu sabi ashar, the 17th stress is hamur rukun ila dunya, the stress of the dunya. Soon of knowledge, brothers, the dunya throws itself at you and it glamours and it glitters. You're, you're here all day seeking knowledge. The people are going to come, they come to you and they say to you, Akhi, while you were sitting here, the Ummah are, mashallah, building palaces and uh, skyscrapers. And you're here just sitting and reading books. And so then they put this place there in your heart. What? Al hirsu al dunya. Run after the dunya. Make money. Allah said in the Quran, Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawati min al nisa'i wal banina wal qanatir al muqantarati min al dahabi wal fiddati wal khayl al musawamati wal an'ami wal harf. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed inside us the love of all of those things. Women, cars, gold, this and etc. We love it. But don't you know that running after the dunya is actually what brings about stress. Running after the dunya will bring stress. You know why it brings stress? It's because you're running after a mirage. You're running after a mirage and every time you get there, there's nothing there. You're running after it, you get there, there's nothing there. So it stresses you out. You become like the dog that's chasing his tail. You just never get to where you're looking for. وَلِذَلِكَ أَبُوْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الدَّارِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ سَنْ كَانَ أَهْلُ الْعِلْمِ بِاللَّهِ وَالْقَبُولِ مِنْهُ The scholars and the people of knowledge, يقولون, they used to say, إِنَّ الزُّهْدَ فِي الدُّنْيَا يُرِيحُ الْقَلْبَ وَالْبَدَن Ah, to be aesthetic from this dunya, to be a person who boycotts this dunya, what will it bring you? Yurihul qalba wal badan. It brings comfort, relaxation to the heart, and it also brings raha to the body. You know when you just become aesthetic, and you leave this dunya, you know what it does for you? You find raha to qalbi wal badan. Ah, the minute you start running after the dunya, you get tired, stressed every day. Well, how much is the currency right now? Oh, it's gone down. No, subhanallah, all oh, my money. That's it. Wallahi brothers, think about it. When you gain knowledge, what would knowledge do to you? Knowledge will protect you. Knowledge will look after you. 
Knowledge will care for you. Knowledge will take care of you. But when you make money, you need to look after the money. You need to take care of it. And the more it gets, the more stressful it gets for you. All day you say, oh, where can I invest this money? I've got so much in my house, I don't know what to do. I just don't hope nobody takes it. Ah, stress. So it's the more it becomes, you should be more enjoying yourself, right? But the more it becomes, the more stressful you become. وَهَذَا حَقِيقَةً That's a reality. So, then he goes on to say, وَإِنَّ الرَّغْبَةَ فِي الدُّنْيَا تُكْثِرُ الْهَمَّ وَالْحَزَنَ He said, the drive and the passion of having in this dunya, it will increase in you depression and sadness and sorrow and fear. وَالْبَطَالَةُ تُخْسِي الْقَلْبَ وَتُغَيِّرُ الْبَدَنَ Laziness and not doing anything will also darken your heart and it will change your body. Some of the Salaf, I mean, some of the scholars, they used to say, إِنَّمَا يَحْصُلُ الْهَمَّ وَالْغَمْ Stress and sadness and sorrow, it comes min jihataini from two angles. التَّقْسِيرُ فِي الطَّاعَةِ When you go short in obedience, وَالْحِرْصُ عَلَى الدُّنْيَا And when you run after the dunya. These two, they bring about depression, they bring about sadness. Sadness comes from those two, they said. What is it, the two ways that sad comes from? التَّقْسِيرُ فِي الطَّاعَةِ When you come short, in obedience of Allah. And the second one is, وَالْحِرْسُ عَلَى الدُّنْيَا So how can a person overcome this stress? The way that they can overcome it is first of all by making dua. By what? By making dua. What kind of dua should you make? By saying to Allah, اللَّهُمَ لَا تَجْعَلِ الدُّنْيَا أَكْبَرَ هَمِّنَا وَلَا مَبْلَغَ عِلْمِنَا Oh Allah, don't make this dunya our greatest ultimate goal. And don't make this dunya our ultimate knowledge. Don't make us the people who just know the dunya. Ah. As Allah said about the disbelievers, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ Hassan al-Basri he said about those people that if they were to see gold before they even weigh the gold, they can tell you how much it weighs. They don't need to touch it. They'll look at it from far and they'll tell you, ah, that's how much it weighs. That gold that you're carrying, it's false. It's, it's fake. Don't bring it to me. He hasn't even looked at it. He hasn't touched it. That's how much he, they know it, he said. Ibn uh, Hassan al-Basri said. But he said, if you see the way that they pray, the way that they do ruku', the way that they do sujood, you'll be shocked. These people don't know nothing. They don't even know tahara. But ya'lamuna dhahlam in the dunya. But when it comes to the matters of this dunya, he said they know it so well. They don't know how to do ruku', they don't know how to do sujood, they don't know how to pray, they know nothing about the basics of Islam. And they, mo and they know more sophisticated things. They know more sophisticated things. SubhanAllah, I was shocked when I especially went to Dubai, for example. That's a place where a lot of the Muslims there are truly businessmen. Everybody's money, business. Those people, every single day, the over overwhelming majority of the Muslims there, every single day they know the currency and the, uh, uh, how much each country the currency is and the rate it is and everything. They'll tell you. Wallahi from the top of their head. They will tell you. Not only that, they'll tell you days ago how much it was. They'll tell you how much it rose and how much it went down. If you, Wallahi, ask them, what's the Islamic calendar today? The Islamic calendar, which is a symbol of Islam. If you ask them what is the Islamic calendar, they may not know. If you ask them how much is the zakat that you need to pay, they don't know anything about it. If you ask them masail pertaining to tahara, they probably don't know it. It's a problem. It's a big problem. So don't ask. Ask Allah wa Taala that He doesn't make you a person who's a scholar in what, in the dunya, and you're jahil about the deen. The second thing that you need to do, brothers, is tarqul hirsi wa tama. Stay away from running after the dunya. Stay away from striving to the dunya and having this desire for the dunya. Stay away from it. Ibrahim ibn Adham, he said, kathratul hirsi wa tama turithul hamma wal jaza. Increasing in striving and desiring the dunya, it will increase in you and it will bring in your heart depression and fear. You get scared. This person is in fihalat al jaza. The person is in ham and gham, depression. He takes what do you call it? Depression tablets, huh? Anxieties and etc. The third, ya ikhwat al kiram, is taqsir al hammi fiha. Shorten in the desire that you have of this dunya. What do I mean by that? What it means is that don't think to yourself that you're going to stay in this dunya for too long. If you look at the overwhelming majority of the people who run after the dunya, who are making money, who are saving, who are opening a savers account and joint account with their spouse and etc. If you look at many of them, they have this belief that they're going to live for a while. 
And that's why they're gathering money. I need this money for my children. I need this money for when I get married. I need this money for this, this time. Who promised you you're going to live? Who promised you that you're going to live? ولذلك أحد الصالحين One of the righteous scholars أحد عباد He one day asked a man to lead the prayer. And the man said to him, I don't want to lead the prayer. He said, lead the prayer. He said, I don't want to lead. And so the man, the abid, he insisted that he goes forward and he leads. So he looked at him and said, I'm going to lead now. I'm going to lead now. But next time, don't ask me again. And he said, you're a fasikh. To even think that there's going to be a next time. We don't think that far. We don't think about a tomorrow prayer. And idea, we're going to pray this salah ka'anna salatam wad'in. We're going to pray this prayer as though it's the last prayer. Why do you think you're going to be tomorrow and the day after? It makes you think you're going to lead us another prayer. Qulu al-amal. This lengthy hope that we have. وَلِذَلِكَ الْحَرَّانِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He said, أَكْبَرُ الْهَمِّ وَالْإِهْتِمَامِ The greatest type of ham, drive and desire and in consideration إِنَّمَا هُوَ مِنْ طُولِ الْأَمَلِ If you see a person who's got aspiration of something and he has what? He has, he gives importance. Just watch it. It's based on طُولِ الْأَمَلِ He believes that there's a lengthy, he's got a future observation. فَلِأَجْلِهِ تُتَكَلَّفُ الْأَعْمَالِ Because of that, he's doing so much work. Look what he's doing. وَالْأَشْغَالِ وَتُجْمَعُ وَتُدَخَّرُ الْأَمْوَالِ And there he is, storing the money, putting it into account, saving. All of that based on what? طول الأمل But a person who knew he was going to die tomorrow, would he do all of that? He wouldn't do all of that. Number four, brothers, is اعتقاد تقلب هذه الدنيا وعدم ثباتها على حال The fourth thing, brothers, to overcome this illness is what? Believing, having this belief that the dunya, it changes situation. This dunya is not as it seems today, it's not going to be like that for you tomorrow. And as some of the Salaf, they used to say, الدنيا إن بقيت لك لم تبقى أنت لها This dunya, even if it remains, listen, the dunya, does it remain the way it is? Yesterday you had money, today you're what? You don't have nothing. You have nothing. I was reading today, subhanAllah, that they're saying the Brexit, due to the Brexit, it could lead to that, that it could lead to the UK driver's license not taking place in Europe. It cannot be used. So a person goes to Europe, can't drive. And yesterday they were together. Yesterday this was dunya ya ikhwah. Something you thought was like this, a law is going to be passed, it can't work anymore, sorry, it doesn't exist anymore. Why? Because it got changed. So the dunya, ya akhi, it's what? Adamu thabatiha, it doesn't remain. Ala halin, according to one situation. And the Salaf, they said, a dunya in baqiyat laka. Let's hypothetically say that the dunya remains for you the way it is. It doesn't change. Lam tabqa anta laha. You're not going to remain for it, are you? You're not going to remain. You're going to go. Even if it stays the way it is, you're not going to stay here forever, are you? So the issue is to know that the dunya muqallibah. This dunya is going to change its situation from one place to another. And one of the greatest things, ya ikhwah, that allows a person to be aesthetic and not see no importance for this dunya is to actually digest this particular point, which is to know that you, what you have today not necessarily might not have it tomorrow. If you're a leader, how many leaders have we seen who were leaders? They were the leaders and they were what? They were killed the way they were killed. They were one time drinking gold cups. And then now what? They were dragged on the ground. Sahih? We saw that, right? Ah, that's the dunya. That's its haqiqah. That's its reality. So don't give no importance. Alhamu thamin ashar. The 18th stress that we go through as students of knowledge or hopefully hoping that we're students of knowledge is hamu hal muslimin The stress of when you look at the situation of the Muslims. A, a student of knowledge becomes stressed. When he looks at what's happening in the Muslim world, what's taking place in Syria, what is taking place in Palestine, what is taking place in Kashmir, what's taking place in Afghanistan, and the Muslim countries, and Somalia, and everywhere, you look at it, you get hurt, you get upset, it stresses you out, it burns your heart. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادِّهِمْ وَتَرَاحُمِهِمْ وَتَعَاطُفِهِمْ كَمَثَلِ جَسَدٍ وَاحِدٍ إِذَا اشْتَكَى مِنُ عُضُونَ تَدَاعَ سَائِرَ الْجَسَدِ بِالسَّهْرِ وَالْحُمَّةِ That the believers are what? Like one body. الْمُؤْمِنُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ كَالْبُنْيَانِ يَشُدُّ بَعْضُهُ بَعْضًا 
They're like one body. If your finger was hurting you tonight, this little finger of yours was hurting you, your whole body won't be able to sleep. This is just a finger. What's it got to do with the eyes? What's it got to do with the other parts of the body? But that finger is connected to your body, so it won't allow your whole body to sleep. You're stressed. You can't sleep. You'll stay awake because of the pain that you have. The believers are like that. The pain that the believers go through in one place of the world, the other Muslims are feeling it with their brothers. They can't sleep because of it. They're stressed. So the student of knowledge is from the greatest people who suffer in this particular issue. So he stresses him out. He sometimes stops him, he's, he gets in the way of his seeking knowledge and etc. So what is it that he needs to do? And he even asks himself, what, am I, what I'm doing, is it right? Uh, the stress comes to you. Ya ikhwa, there's a problem that, that is out there, right? Bloodshed, innocent people dying, women, children. But it needs a solution. And the solution, Ya Ikhwa, is Mu'asalatu Bala. By carrying on seeking knowledge, by learning. The reason is because huwa min i'dadil udda. That's actually a preparation for victory. That's the road to victory. The reason is why the later generation are not going to through, they're not going to attain success the later generation us we're not going to attain success except that which the pious predecessors found success in ahmed for what he found success in and shafi'i and malik and bukhari and others is what we're going to find success in and what they found success in was with knowledge ya ikhwa jahlul ummah the ignorance being in the ummah of their religion, yujibu da'afaha, is actually what brings about weakness. Didn't the Prophet say, la yati zaman illa walladhi ba'dahu ashabru bin? That there's, there's, there does not come a time, except the generation that come after it are worse. And then what did the hadith mention? That this, this it being worse, doesn't mean that the crops are low. It doesn't mean that the vegetation is low. What it actually means that what it actually means is that the fuqaha and the ulama are going to die. And who's going to remain? Those who don't know. وَلِذَلِكَ The Prophet told us in the hadith, لَا تَقُومُ السَّاعَةِ The hour will not strike. حَتَّى يُرْفَعُ الْعِلْمِ Knowledge will be taken up. وَيَكْثُرُ الْجَهْلِ And ignorance will spread. And the Prophet also told us what? And haraj, killing will also take place in large amount. Powerful, isn't it not, brothers? That ignorance was mentioned in the context of bloodshed becoming more. So it's by learning, by educating ourselves with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will actually bring about victory for the ummah. And by being ignorant of our religion is what will weaken the ummah. That's why even in jihad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُ كَافَةً Not every single person should go and fight. فَلَوْ لَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فرقة. If a group go, Allah wa ta'ala would tell us, Lalay ta'ifa, a party. Laysa al mu'minuna li yanfiru kafa, falawla nafara min kulli firqati minhum ta'ifa tu li atafakahu fi dini wa li yunziru kawmuhum ida rajaru ilayhim na alam yahdarun. That a group of people should remain and that they should stay so that they can warn the ones who've come back. Because those who've come back weren't seeking knowledge, they were fighting. They need their brothers who are staying behind, who are learning, who are educating themselves to, to educate them when they come back. So not everybody goes to fight because ilm is given importance. وَلِذَلِكَ الْعَلَّامَ نَظِيرَ Hussein al-Dihlawi from India رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ رَحْمَةً وَاسِعَةً When the British troops came into India الْعَلَّامَ نَظِيرَ Hussein al-Dihlawi When the British troops came into India and they were killing the Muslims. Nadir Hussein al Dihlawi was still teaching Sahih al Bukhari. He did not stop the teaching. They carried on teaching. And every time through Islamic history, if you look, calamities were happening, the Muslims were suffering, but seeking knowledge did not stop. And the day that the Muslims do stop seeking knowledge and they do stop, then that's what brings about. That is what brings about the problem increases it. Al-Buka'i wa tabaki crying and wailing and screaming and acting emotional will not benefit us 
if we turn away from what? If we turn away from the foundations that we should be upon, which is knowledge. Number 19, brothers, is Hamu taqliyatul wilayati qabla bulughil raya. Before we reach our ultimate goal and we reach being scholars and people of knowledge, leadership is given to us. We become in charge of matters. We become project managers. We become even presidents and prime ministers, etc. We take over authorities and, and leadership. And our, our noble, the noble companion Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Tafaqahu, attain knowledge, learn, qabla an tusawwadu, before you are placed in charge, before you're put in charge of anything, attain knowledge and learn. So the student of knowledge, he's put in those places because of what? The stress increases because you have as an individual the need to go forward and do things in the community. Your community need your help. They need you to take projects on board. They need you to do things. But then you want to learn because you haven't reached your goal in knowledge. You haven't reached far. You're still wanting to attain knowledge. But you have to take charge of mes mes a masjid, for example. You have to be the chairman of the masjid. Or you have to be a committee member. And be busy with what? The issues of the community. But that's going to take away from your what? From your seeking knowledge. So how does one overcome that? And how does he deal, how does he deal with that? The first is that if he's able to not take those positions before he reaches the place that he wants to seek to gain in knowledge, he should not take those positions and he should refuse it. But if it becomes binding and it becomes obligatory on him that he takes it for reasons that he sees, then what he should do is he should reconcile, he should, sorry, he should combine between playing that role and also attaining knowledge. He should what? He should make sure that he gains knowledge whilst giving. And this also is similar with the 20th point. This is also similar to the 20th point, which is tasaddi. This is also similar to the 20th to the 20th point, which is tasaddi wal ifada. A person wants to go out and he wants to become a lecturer. He wants to be a speaker. He wants to be a da'i and give da'wah. But he also knows he hasn't fully attained the knowledge he wanted. This is not leadership necessarily. He's a just a per he's a person who wants to take methalan riasatu fil ilm methalan. Maybe leadership in the religion. He wants to benefit others, but he wants to also benefit as well. So how does he reconcile between this? This is the stress that a student of knowledge will also have. The scholars, they say, to overcome this one is by doing the following two. You place a time, waqtu tahammul, a time in your schedule where you take on knowledge. This is called waqtu tahammul, the time where I take on knowledge. I gain knowledge. I study, I learn, and then you place second time, which is waqtu adai wa tabligillah, a time where you go out and you convey that knowledge that you learned and you pass it on. And if a person does that, then they will attain success and they will overcome this stress. But if you do one, as in you go out and you do tabligh, and you're not gaining anything, you're not gaining knowledge, and you're not enhancing in your knowledge then you're going to not definitely not number one increase in knowledge and secondly you will definitely be speaking without knowledge in the long run you'll be speaking what without knowledge because there's going to come nawazil and mustajiddat contemporary matters are going to come to you because you haven't equipped yourself well because you've not been studying you're going to struggle these were, ya ikhwat al-kiram, 20 stresses. They are jima'ul usul. They are the foundation of all of the stresses that a student of knowledge would have. We clarified in this series and in these lectures, we clarified these stresses, each and every one of them, the ways to overcome it. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to take away from any one of us stresses, depression, and any Muslim who has it. And that Allah wa Taala, He uplifts us in knowledge, and He makes us those who implement what they know. And anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect, or a fault or error, or slip of the tongue, is from me as Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.